I've been reading a lot of really good books lately, so I thought it'd be fun to do a simple video where I just go through and recommend some of these really great reads. This is kind of a range from nonfiction and philosophy all the way to fiction and even like some fantasy books. But we're going to start with a book that's often kind of held up as like a self-help book, which is not a genre that I'm the biggest fan of. I often view self-help books as offering you quick fixes, life hacks that don't actually work. They make you feel good for a little while. But if you're looking for like real genuine self-improvement or really trying to make yourself into a better person, then those self-help books really aren't that helpful. And in fact, I think they kind of tend to promote kind of narcissism that I think we should all try to avoid. But this book is an exception, and that's Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. This book really is about how you can manage your relationship with technology, which is probably something that you've thought at least a little bit about if you watch channels like this, or if you spend a little bit too much time on YouTube. I have not read any other Cal Newport books. I haven't read anything about deep work or any of his productivity stuff, but actually some people in my discord were talking about digital minimalism and actually found it useful themselves. And so I thought I would actually just read the book. And you know what? I ended up really enjoying this book for a couple of reasons. One is that there is like a, a heavy practical element to this book, and for that reason, those sections can be read fairly quickly. And we'll talk about those practical sections in just a second. But I actually really like those earlier, more philosophical chapters. Cal Newport thinks that we need a different kind of philosophy to make sense of our relationship to technology. And one of the reasons that this is so important is that we're really fighting an uneven battle here. There are tech companies out there, content creators, marketing advertisers or experts, even psychologists who use tons of research to then work for these corporations who are all trying to get one thing from you, and that's your attention. So your phone is basically being optimized over time to get your attention. Your YouTube algorithm, your TikTok algorithm, all of those algorithms, those are being optimized to keep you clicking to stay on the platform. One option is that we could just give in completely, lose control, stop thinking critically about our relationship with these technologies, and let them run our lives. That doesn't sound very good. Another option is to just say no to all of it. I have a lot of sympathy for the Neo-Luddites, but I mean, I probably couldn't live that way um, given how I make money in the world now, right? And also, I think there are real benefits to some of these platforms and some of this technology, and it's about finding the right relationship to it. And so the third way is, is digital minimalism. And one of the most helpful bits of this book is that Newport walks you through like a 30-day challenge to try to recalibrate your relationship to technology. So if you're maybe struggling with your relationship with technology, then Newport's Digital Minimalism is a book that you're going to want to check out. There's a kind of novel that I seriously dislike, and I would actually extend this to nonfiction works too. I like books, so I like writers. What I tend not to like is reading about a writer writing a book. There are maybe a few examples of this kind of writing that I really enjoy, but I often find that this writing is self-indulgent and it doesn't actually make for a good reading experience. But an exception to that is this book by Paul Kingsnorth, that's Savage Gods. I thought this was a novel. I thought it was fictionalized. Um, it's heavily metaphorical. It uses a lot of imagery in a way that you would expect from a novel rather than a set of essays. But the publisher apparently list this as nonfiction. Paul Kingsnorth has written a couple of novels now. If Even if you don't include this, he at least has a trilogy out. Um, I have read at least one of those books and I recommend it. But I just generally like Kingsnorth's writing a good bit. I really like Paul Kingsnorth's Substack, um, which I'll link to down below in case people are interested in, it, in reading it. He is blending together a lot of things that I find really interesting. He's coming from a heavily environmentalist background. Uh, he was a very active environmentalist for a very long time. Now he's moved to a small holding in Ireland where he's basically just farming with his family. He's raising his kids with his wife. He's interested in mythology. He's interested in religion and spirituality and particularly Orthodox Christianity. And he just weaves all of these concerns together as he's just writing about trying to make it in the world. And one of the ways that he makes it in the world really is through writing. It's really deep down, I think, actually about Kingsnor's relationship with words themselves. What happens when you are a writer and the words won't come? What happens when you're a writer and you depend on those words for your livelihood 
and yet they don't feel like they're your friends anymore. They're actually something that need to be wrestled with. The book is an extremely quick read. You could read it in an evening. It clocks in at just a little over 100 pages, and it's written in these very short paragraphs that are broken up into these little sections. Um, I think it's a book that's probably actually best enjoyed in one or two sittings if you can manage it. Now, before we go into our next book, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, brilliant. Learning new things is something that I always try to make time for, and I have a feeling you're that sort of person too, and brilliant is going to help you find more time to learn new things. So you might know that I have a PhD in philosophy. When I left academia, though, there were things that I just didn't know and skills I had to learn as I started working actually in the tech world. Those are things about computer science and data science, for instance. And I had to learn those things all on my own. Well, if I'd had a tool like Brilliant, it would have been a lot simpler. In just 15 minutes a day, you can learn about math, data analysis, and computer science. If you're interested in data analysis, Brilliant can teach you about the fundamentals of probability theory. This is at the heart of a lot of the AI stuff that we talk about now in these like large language models. There's a lot of math going on in the background and Brilliant could help teach you about some of that math. If you use my link, you'll save 20% on a subscription with Brilliant. That link is brilliant.org slash Jared Henderson. And on top of that, you get a 30 day free trial. So go check out Brilliant and use that risk-free 30-day trial. So a lot of my reading this year has been in historical fiction. I haven't really read this genre much before. I have never made like a concerted effort to read more historical fiction. I'd often been more like literary fiction, like reading classics or just reading science fiction and fantasy when I was reading fiction. But I've been reading more historical fiction lately and I am loving it. Probably the best example of this actually would be War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, but I'm not done with War and Peace yet, so I won't talk about it in this video. The best historical fiction book though that I finished this year is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. So Wolf Hall is historical fiction. It's Tudor fiction. Um, so it's written around the time of the Protestant Reformation and set in England. And I didn't think much of that sounded all that interesting to me. I mean, historically, I guess I'd like to learn more about the Protestant Reformation, but I don't really have a huge interest in Tudor fiction. It just sounds stuffy and boring. And then you tell me that it's about Thomas Cromwell, who is an important character in English history, but but probably is not even like a top 10 of people in English history that I'm personally interested in. And this book just defies all expectations. One, its portrayal of Thomas Cromwell makes him incredibly interesting to the point where I'm actually going to read a biography of Cromwell after I finish this series. Two, the prose in this in this book is, it's tremendous. Very little of it, I would say, is, is flowery or beautiful. It's not the kind of stuff that we look at on the page and say, wow, how gorgeous. But you can tell that Mantell is bringing a lot of care to the way that she writes. And you can tell that there's a kind of economy to her prose. She is using language precisely the way that she wants to. It does have a strict viewpoint with Cromwell, but it's it's very locked into what is going on in his head and his perceptions. It's not uncommon to have a book that is written in a third person limited, but the way that it's just so tightly connected to Cromwell, um, everything is being filtered through his own perceptions. You might think that this should be a story about Thomas More or Erasmus, who was mentioned a few times, or Cardinal Wolsey, or King Henry, or his many wives leading up to this, this historic need for a divorce or a nullification or an annulment, um, depending on who you talk to, that was so pivotal in the English Reformation. And yet, Mantell chooses to write it about Cromwell, and I think that ends up being a great choice. There is some action. There's not a ton of action in this book. A lot of it is done very subtly. When it happens, it's gripping. The book actually starts with a fight scene, something I was not expecting, and it works so well. It offers characterization immediately. It's not gratuitous in any way. I would say nothing about this book actually is gratuitous. I just was reading this book and I knew that I was kind of in the presence of a modern master. Now, I haven't just been reading fiction or self-help, I guess. I've also been reading some philosophy. I've been reading some Hegel, but we're not going to talk about Hegel in this video. I've been returning to the Stoics for another little project, but we're not going to talk about the Stoics in this video. Instead, I want to just mention Simone Weil's book, The Need for Roots. I have often recommended books by the writer 
Wendell Berry. And one of the reasons I talk about Wendell Berry is because of his emphasis on rootedness as a kind of countering to individualism in the modern age. Also his writings on the dignity of labor, of the need to stay in one place, to be around people, to live more slowly and intentionally, and how this leads to a more meaningful life. Berry has a tendency to put all of this in terms of his vocation as a farmer and as a poet. And he's often very insightful, but he doesn't bring that explicit philosophical lens to his writing. And that's where Simone Vi really picks up the slack. This is a book about all of those things. When it says it's the need for roots, of course, it's about being rooted. She talks about this, this affliction many of us have of being uprooted. I mean, I know personally, I'm you know, I moved for college, I moved for grad school, I moved for grad school again, and then I moved across the country to move to Texas. I sort of decided to stay in Austin or the surrounding area, I think basically for the rest of my life. I love it here. I'm going to stay here. And in part, one of the reasons I did that is because I need it for myself, but also um, for like my son or for any other future children. I want them to just grow up in one place around people that they can know their whole lives. That can feel like a romantic or even a kind of weird faux nostalgic inclination, but Vi actually gives you a lot of the philosophical rationale for wanting to live this way. I think many people feel this sense that they're kind of rootless, that they're kind of just drifting through different places. They feel like they need to move every couple of years and they can't understand like why, like wh why do they feel this way or why shouldn't they feel this way? And if those are the kind of questions that you're interested in, you need to read The Need for Roots. We're going to talk about two book series really quickly. They're both, I guess you could say, also historical fiction, though they have some fantasy elements. Let's start with the one that might be a fantasy book, but I don't think really is, and that is The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell. I love King Arthur. I, I love stories about King Arthur. I love the Arthurian legend. One of my favorite fantasy books ever is The Once and Future King, but I love basically every version of the Arthurian legend that I've ever read. I love just hearing about this character, this mythic important figure in the English imagination being retold in many different ways. I, I cannot get enough of this stuff. Cornwell is a historical fiction writer, and he is often known for his attention to historical detail. And you have to wonder how he's going to write an Arthurian legend. One, because the figure of King Arthur is contested by historians. Most people say that he doesn't didn't exist. There was no single figure like Arthur. Uh, and two, there are lots of obvious accretions. There, if, if Arthur existed, there wouldn't have been anything like the Holy Grail quest at the time. And also Merlin is a clearly fantastical figure. So where do you fit him in? Cornwell makes some very interesting choices, basically turning... Arthur into the bastard son of a king who is a warlord. He's British and he is going to fight off the invading Anglo-Saxons. Cornwell actually writes at the end of each of these books little historical explanations for why he made certain choices. So even though he is writing kind of a fantastic tale, he's still grounding it in a lot of real history. Also, all of the fantastic elements like Merlin being a druid, doing all of these druidy things, they could all be interpreted kind of naturalistically in a way that it's actually just people wanting them to be real rather than it being real. So I think actually this is not a fantasy book. It's historical fiction in that regard. It doesn't have magic, basically. It doesn't have real magic. I think both Lancelot and Guinevere, this is one of the best portrayals of those two characters. It's very different than the one that you get in, say, The Once and Future King. But I think that it's just a great take on both characters. Um, I've never hated a character quite so much as I hate Lancelot, actually, from the Warlord Chronicles. Or at least it's a little recent, so maybe my emotions are high. But I, I really hated him in a way that just proves that Cornwall is just being a very effective writer. There were some genuine times in this book that I wanted to shed tears. I don't cry because of books very often. I think the last book to really make me bawl my eyes out was maybe The Red Fern, Where the Red Fern Grows. Um, but occasionally they can get me a little misty-eyed at least. And this book, this book got me close. There were some high emotions and none of it felt cheap. All of it felt earned. Cornwell has written tons of books like the ones that inspired the Netflix show, The Last Kingdom. He also has this, um, this Sharp series that's more about a British soldier uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. I haven't read those yet. I want to read them. There's always so much that you want to read, but Cornwell's Warlord Chronicles is certainly a, a big recommend from me. And that brings us to the last series that we're going to talk about. 
This is by one of my favorite fantasy writers. And while there aren't a ton of fantastical elements in this book, um, there are some, and it's clearly fantasy. Um, and this is The Serentine Mosaic by Guy Gavro K. So K, one of my favorite fantasy writers. Tigana, one of my favorite fantasy books. I have always loved K's prose. I've always loved his relatively light magic. He adds magic to his stories, but they are, it's never really the emphasis. It's not like reading a Brandon Sanderson where you're really reading it for the magic system. It's nothing like that. Uh, it's often very tastefully done. In fact, I would say a lot of uh, K can be described as being very tasteful. But I also truly love K's innovative settings. Tigana has this kind of Renaissance vibe to it. And the Serentine Mosaic is actually just, just modeled on the Byzantine Empire, to the point where I kind of wondered why he doesn't just write historical fiction about the Byzantine Empire. He obviously knows it well enough. I don't think Kay's prose are as strong in this series as they are in Tigana or elsewhere, but I do think it's better written than like his series, The Finnevar Tapestry. I do think his grounding in history and using settings like the Byzantine Empire does a really nice job of removing us from generic fantasy land in a way that I think is really impressive and admirable. And I think that his choice to quickly bounce from point of views, depending on the chapter or even within a chapter, actually serves the story very, very well. It's not like, oh, here's a chapter, we're only going to hear from this one character, here's another chapter. He'll sometimes paragraph to paragraph be bouncing around in different people's heads. He'll often show the same event two or three times from different perspectives. I think that's done very effectively. I mean, I have to probably just mention it again, one of the reasons that I love this series so much is that it's set in the Byzantine Empire. I am very interested in the Byzantine Empire. I'm very interested in Byzantium or Eastern Rome, especially after the fall of the city of Rome. And so to just read fantasy that is not set obviously in Western Europe or obviously based on Tolkien-inspired, you know, English, Norse, Germanic myth or something just feels very refreshing. So it's one of those great things where you can read a fantasy book, which for me are often my escape readings. It's my relaxing reading, maybe right before I go to bed. And yet I don't feel like I'm reading the same book that I've read again and again and again and again. And that's why I like Kay. And that's why I've really enjoyed the Serentine Mosaic. All right. That's going to end it for us today. I want to hear about any books that you've read lately. This is a, this is a casual video where I'm just talking about books that I love. So I would love to hear about books that you've read recently that you loved too.